Welcome back to part two of John, the Apostle John. And today we are going to focus on the icon element, this book he's holding. Not just to scroll the teaching of the apostles, but he's always historically associated with the Gospel of John and the letters of John, even though his name is never mentioned in those writings as being the author, whereas in the book of Revelation, and he is mentioned a number of times as the author. And so he is a major contributor, traditionally understood, of the New Testament. What an incredible gift Providence has given us through this amazing, sensitive, profound soul that went into the depths, not of just of the sea, went into the depths of the Trinity went into the depths of the connection between the Old and the New Testament, like the entire New Testament does. Uh, it really is a great um, eloquent witness to that. And I w I'm fascinated by the prologue, really by every chapter in John's Gospel. It's just such a treat. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The echo of the words of Genesis, in the beginning God created the world. And everything was made through him. And the Word has made flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, the glory of the only begotten Son of the Father. You know, this whole <laughs> text is, is such a joy. And then we could go through all the different stories that John gives us. Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the raising of Lazarus, the uh, woman who was accused of adultery and Jesus writing on the sand. And these are things that John witnessed firsthand up close front seat. Maybe not front seat, but right standing there helping, holding something for Jesus. Listening to every word, penetrating his heart. And so he gives us this extraordinary teaching to, about Jesus, this uh, information about Jesus, this experience of Jesus. He encountered Jesus. He came to visit him like Jesus invited him the first day. Come and see. And they spent the whole afternoon with Jesus. And we could say that John spent his whole life with Jesus after that. And he really got into his mystery. Sometimes people have been critical. And there are waves, just like in the, in the water, there are waves. And uh, in culture and fashion, there are waves. There are waves also, actually, in exegesis. And there was a wave of great criticism about John's gospel, that the other three gospels are very earthy, earthy, down to very factual. And John's gospel is very flies high like an eagle uh, into the spiritual realms, uh, very high, almost philosophical, theological. But actually, it was discovered in archaeology that the five porticos where this uh, paralyzed man was healed, and this is in John's Gospel, it's one of his stories, um, they said this is symbolic, like all John's Gospel is symbolic. But the archaeology found them at the pools of Bethesda, at the Church of St. Anna today in Jerusalem, just uh, east of the Via Dolorosa beginnings. Um, it's, it's, uh, since then, uh, the scholars... Uh, reassessed their approach to John and appreciated the historicity of his gospel and how many details he was full, the gospel of John brings to play. And they're coming from also experience and witness. We have all these signs. When he sees miracles, he communicates them as a sign into the mystery, into the depth. He goes into the depth of Christ, into the depth of God's work in us. We have the Last Supper conversations of Jesus in depth, pondered for already for 60 years probably, in depth, going into the deep of the love revealed by Christ, the love promised already in chapter 6 of John's Gospel about the Eucharist. And so he can now explain that in the discourse about love and how we're to love one another as I have loved you. We also have in John's Gospel that God the Father loved the world so much that he gave his only Son for our redemption. This is the, this, the vision of John. We talk about the vision in the Apocalypse, but this is the vision, the understanding of John, of the nature of God. God is love. This is unique. This is the core of our Christian faith. And because of these insights, he's been called sometimes the theologian by great, especially in the Eastern uh, fathers of the church. 
Let's go to a different chapter. We go to the Apocalypse, the book of Revelation. And to know the context is important because the churches are being persecuted from the outside but also from the inside because there's a huge crisis about the thought that corresponds to Revelation and the invasion of mindsets and philosophies that were not from scriptural, from biblical, from the work of Revelation such as Gnosticism. And already this challenge is being experienced by the church. And the book of Revelation is also dealing with the intense persecution of the believing communities. And John is showing us the vision of glory forever in the wedding feast of the Lamb and how these 144,000 and how the, the, the vision of the heavenly Jerusalem coming down and the 12 courses of stone, the 12 apostles, the 12 tribes, this unity once again of the old and the new, the eternal fulfillment. It's not an earthly kingdom that Jesus has brought. He's painting for us the eternal kingdom of glory. And it's not a witness that's only theoretical. Because if we go back to the Acts of the Apostles, we find John and Peter rejoicing because they were considered worthy to suffer in their flesh for the kingdom of Christ. They were scourged unjustly, and they rejoiced over that. What a far cry from the first John we had who wants to be number one, and he wants to destroy a village in Samaria because they refused Jesus' access, and now he's rejoicing to suffer for the name of Jesus. What an incredible gift Providence has given us through this apostle, one of the twelve, the witnesses of the Lamb. Their teaching is the foundation of the church's life. And their successors, in the case of John, were very clear and uh, historically documented, and that's another chapter for another day. Come back next week to look at Thomas, a very different apostle.